Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Firon. Welcome to Episode 5, Conversation, Peter Vale, David Firon, Thinking Out Loud About Practice. Practice? Practice? What's that? Well, we return to our fundamental way of thinking about practice to kick off this phase of our conversation. So we look at some more conjectures in light of what we've said and thought so far. So welcome to episode five. I think before we get into this conversation, Peter, I'd like to remind folks of the point of departure for all of the thinking yeah. that we've been reporting so far. Our way uh, of thinking about practice. Mm-hmm. We, we, we don't call it a, a definition or a theory. We just want people to know that if you have a little bit of something to stand on, things work better than if you're just free, free floating all the time. So I'm going to read it again, but I'll put it in terms of what I think about now when I think about practice. Practice is my conscious ability fairly consistently to produce intended results and to do so across a wide range of circumstances and to do so while growing and changing myself to meet the changing circumstances in which my practices exist. And I put that in plural because I'm doing several things to make myself grow and change. Uh, through the circumstances as they arise. Well, and as as one of our conjectures uh, is that pra- practice is usually a collection of practices, so it's good to keep it keep it plural because the uh, modifications you're talking about in that in that way of thinking uh, are going to be in terms of a number of practices that all go together to make the focal practice that uh, that we're talking about. So given how I stated it this time, I was looking from the inside out on that definition and on the wider question of what is practice. Is it your point of view, Peter, that practice is best known by the practitioner, known through the mind and eyes and and brain of the person who is looking ahead and seeing what's going on and adapting. Exactly. Uh, the point being that if we're, if we're trying to understand practice, I think as we've said in an earlier podcast, pr- practice is best understood from the point of view of a practitioner, not from the point of view of an external observer. That's your inside out notion. And how often do we actually stop and observe a, a, a practice and a practitioner and criticize from the outside or make judgments from the outside? Um, you love to play golf or on a, and on all right, what I hope is a steep learning curve yes. in your golf game. Just think about all the golfers. I've watched, love to watch PGA golf. Uh, every Sunday afternoon. Think of all the golfers who come off the course moaning and groaning about their game when they've shot 65 or something. (laughs) And what they're conscious of is all of the ways that they could have shot 62 or 61. And there was this guy, uh, Justin Thomas, last week who uh, shot the 61 that won him the tournament. And he had it about a he was on the green. He had a 25-foot putt or something. I mean, the probability of him making it was close to zero. It was a long, long putt. And the announcer comes on and then a hushed voice says, he's putting for a 59. Well, <laughs> well, that's the external point of view. From his point of view, he's just trying to make the darn putt. And he, he actually didn't make the 59 foot. 59 putt, he didn't make the 60 putt. He made the third putt for 61. 
So his consciousness was of the imperfection of his game. Everybody else was marveling at the perfection of his game. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I'm not saying that it's impermissible to to look at things from the outside in an, an analytical way, or even just a way of simple enjoyment of the of the activity. But, but uh, it is so much more fruitful to try to look at this from the point of view of the individual whose practice we're trying to understand. I might just say that, that one of our conjectures is, in fact, of the perceptual quality of practice. Mm-hmm. Practice is the way things look to the practitioner, the way the problem looks, the way the client looks to the practitioner or the way the group looks if if it's a practice in relation to a group what the practitioner is thinking about uh, what the practitioner is emphasizing what the practitioner is ignoring what the practitioner is letting go how many times have i walked into a doctor's office with some condition i wanted he or she to to look at only to find that from their point of view it's a it's a not especially important it's a it's a pimple it's not cancer <laughs> uh, and, and uh, we've all had that experience where a practitioner has a different point of view about the issue than the the client or the or the customer and so we use the word perceptual in that famous book uh, in search of excellence by tom peters and bob waterman peters says in so many words thinking about excellent organizations. It's all perception. Percep- I think he says, perception is all there is. <laughs> and um, it, the point he's making is, uh, if you don't look at it from the organization's point of view, you're never going to understand what is driving them and, and creating what we call as an external, as an external evaluation what we call excellence. So an alternative word for for perceptual is perspectival. Wow, that's a mouthful. (laughs) uh, It it turns the word perspective into an adjective. Perspectival. My my, uh, colleague, now colleague, then doctoral student Eric Dent used to walk in the office and... uh, and use that term, and it always grated on my ear. Pers- perspectival. Uh, it sounded so, uh, I don't know, academic or something. Do we really need it? Uh, and all it does is emphasize the perspective, uh, the glasses through which an individual is viewing the world. And if, percep- if perceptual does it for a person, then by all means, uh, you know, let perspe- perspective will go. But uh, there are times when it is useful to emphasize the actual perspective, where the person is standing that leads them to think and feel the way they do. Okay, so um, that to me is a kind of a foundational idea that uh, a number of the conjectures that I hope we're going to talk about this afternoon, a number of these conjectures rest on the on the actual difference between the way the world looks from the outside and the way the issue looks from the inside of the practitioner's point of view. Just uh, pops into my head that when we're teaching, when we're we're, a, uh, we're working at a golf course as a pro, and someone says, "Will you watch me putt? Will you watch my my drive?" There are many occasions when we, the practitioner, will seek a, a, an external point of view. Show me something that you see that I'm not seeing. But if the dominance is always referring to the external point of view, thinking of us in management classrooms over the years, a lot of power behind the teacher, maybe the power of the grade book or whatever the power is, it kind of mutes what we're talking about here today, to have that external 
person judging, doing their own perceiving, and then putting into your mind what's excellent and what's not. So could we play around with that just a little bit? Uh, because it just strikes me that we've got to look at the balance of power here going forward on behalf of our listeners, or even a little well, bit more power than the external person. It is, it is certainly not either or. You, you don't have to make a choice. And it's not necessarily that one is better than the other. I think the point of view that I'm, that I'm taking is simply to, to call attention to the inner, so-called inner frame of reference, um, because it gets such a short shrift in so many ways. And we make judgments from the outside so often. But certainly there are plenty of times in the external judgments, evaluations, uh, measurements are essential. And you have to look at, at, the, at the issue or the problem from an outside point of view. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess the argument would be that the, that the really mature and powerful way to function here would be to be able to move smoothly back and forth between the different points of view. Because in fact, there's not just one external view. There are multiple different points of view from the outside. And there are multiple different points of view from the inside too. The practitioner is not a monolith in his or her thinking. So that they uh, shift around in their perspective. And we need to be sensitive to that too. And in fact, as we have said emphatically in these podcasts, practice is a learning process. So mm -hmm. the, practi the practitioner has to be allowed to change his or her mind and develop and change. And this little way of thinking that you read at the very beginning actually um, emphasizes that kind of flexibility and um, self self-modification, in fact. Define learning as self-modification in a in a certain sense. I like um, that. I like the sense of that. Yeah. Now, it's a complex thing that we're talking about. Philosophers have debated it over the centuries. A couple of broken down management professors are not going to solve the problem in one podcast. But uh, <laughs> I uh, resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> But we're, we're, I think what we're doing is trying to put this ancient issue of the point of view from which the world is seen. We're trying to, to weave this ancient issue into the understanding of practice. That's right. Um, and to show how an understanding of practice and of the practitioner is um, it's, that it's essential that we take account of both the inside and the outside. What were some of these other uh, conjectures that we were going to talk about? Do you have a list somewhere, or is your oh. memory better than mine? <laughs> I have the list. And uh, uh, I want to jump to one, Peter, because uh, it's uh, it says what practice is not. And it says that practice is not often experimental. Right. What do we mean by that? Well, I'll take responsibility for that one. Uh, you, you, if it doesn't make any sense to you, then... Uh, well, it probably would if I really went back and read carefully what we'd written about it. But, it, no. it, 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 you know, on the one hand, we're saying make up your mind as a learner, you know, literally learn to make up your mind. And on the other hand, we're talking about experimental and not experimental. Yeah. Let's play with well, that one. <clears throat> the conjecture is that the, from the, again, here we are with a, with a perceptual issue. From mm -hmm. the practitioner's point of view, I'm suggesting that the practitioner is not experimenting in kind of the classical meaning of that word because the practitioner can't just can't just unwind an intervention that he or she may have made with a client and say, oh, by the, by the way, that experiment didn't work. Let's try another one. Um, from the client's point of view, that's kind of nerve-wracking. Yes. 
from the client's point of view, he or she would like to feel that the practitioner knows what they're doing and that the interventions, the suggestions the practitioner is making, the solutions, problem solutions that the practitioner is offering are carefully thought out and not they're not experiments. They're, they're careful interventions. Whether it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, like a doctor and a patient or an attorney and a, and a client or a practice in relation to a group, say a, an internal auditor in relation to the finances of a whole department, that the statements that the practitioner makes are taken as more than just experiments. And so my suggestion is that the practitioner himself or herself isn't experimenting so much as they are conducting a conscious learning process themselves in relation to a client or a group of clients, and that they might feel that they need to change direction and maybe withdraw or modify a series of interventions that they've been making. Um, but not because these are experiments, not because they're experiments in the classical sense, but because at the time they were the practitioner's best thinking about what needs to be done. And if it turns out that what that, that idea about what needs to be done turns out not to be appropriate or not to be a useful approach, okay, learn from that and try to synthesize a new approach that takes account of what we have learned already about the about the client or the the community's point of view. And I'm just saying that if you think in terms of the classical experiment where the experimenter is free to then withdraw the treatments that have been made and try others without consequence from the practitioner's point of view, there are consequences of the interventions. It's important that they not be regarded as simply as experiments, but rather as interventions that rep represent the best judgment at the time that the client, that the practitioner had. Well, I hope that doesn't sound too garbled to you, but that's kind of the essence of the conjecture. Um, no, it's not it, 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 because what I'm hearing is that the best thought you can bring to the moment because practice is action and that's how we pick up whether in that moment, our knowledge is working or not. But I can also see there's a role, definitely a role for the classic experimenter uh, who does the work in a more controlled way with the scientific method and all of that, and then reports uh, out to the practice world. Here's something new to think about. Here's something you didn't know. Now, now we know it. So it isn't either or there too, but I see that the practitioner is out there always on the edge of time being tested in a way that the laboratory never does. And you're being tested with people in, in, in your, and it's their lives that you're uh, involved with at that moment. Right. right. It's a lot of responsibility to know what you're doing. <laughs> Well, but even even in a slightly more um, uh, maybe let's say a, a slightly more lighthearted way, when you're standing there getting ready to hit a drive <laughs> uh, on a 450 yard dogleg to the left, your drive is not an experiment. Your, your drive is a commitment of your best judgment, the best application of your skill, such as it is. <laughs> and so your ball lands where it lands and you have to deal with where, where it landed in, in the next shot. That's right. And the game, of, the game of golf has all kinds of arcane rules about what to do when the ball lands out of bounds. Out or of bounds, yeah. In a, in a sprinkler yeah. head or... Yeah. All kinds of things that, the, that can happen to the drive. 
uh, that may or may not be the practitioner's responsibility. One way or another, you you got to get to the green and, and get the uh, ball in the cup. Uh, so there's a lot there. And now I get a better idea of what we meant by practice is not often experimental. Uh, there's another one here that uh, gets back to perception, I think. Practice often precedes theory. Since we're now talking about what experimental, <laughs> what science produces in the way of theory, practice often precedes theory. What does that mean? Well, I love this one. Um, <laughs> Uh, you could write a. This happens to be a. This happens to be a conjecture that I feel pretty good about in, ter in terms of its validity. You could write a book. You could write several books uh, around this conjecture. I think that, namely, if you take the substance of a, of a given field and you uh, ask where where have the key concepts come from? How did they arise within the field? Uh, what was their source? Uh, the conjecture here is that it is frequently the practitioner in that field who comes up with the in initial insight. Uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, I think it was Galileo who was, or I may be wrong about this, it was it was one of those early uh, experimenters or scientific inquirers, investigators, who was trying to get water out of a mine. That was the that was the uh, practical problem, and they they figured out how to get the water out of the mine, and that led, at a theoretical level, then to the principle of the siphon, and and the use of um, air pressure, differential air pressure, to move water seemingly uphill. But the practical problem was preceded all of the mathematical theory that ultimately became a, a foundational idea in physics. One of our, one of our most cherished um, theories in the management leadership field is the notion of management by objectives. Yeah. Well, that arose that arose from practice practitioners who informally began applying the notion of setting objectives and pursuing them, and using that as a way of of um, evaluating the performance of an individual, as well as the process of solving the problem. And another one that I would happen to be personally present for, uh, the idea of matrix organizations. Matrix organizations are now found in a whole chapter in the textbook as, oh, a, yeah. <laughs> as an alternative to bureaucratic hierarchies, but they were invented uh, by the Rand Corporation, a combination of the Rand Corporation and the TRW Systems Group in Redondo Beach, California. And the practical problem they had was that they were hiring all of these high powered scientists from the East. And the high powered scientists did not want to function in cubby holes. They wanted to talk to their colleagues, they wanted to work in a multidisciplinary way. Um, they, did, they just did not want to be locked into a job definition in a hierarchy. And so the idea of the matrix where you have rows composed of, of projects and columns composed of disciplines, that a given, a, a given scientist might, be, might work across several disciplines on several different projects and be, have, a, have a different supervisor for each one. These are all characteristics of matrix organizations. They would make Max Weber turn over in his grave. <laughs> uh, the the one father of, the of bureaucracy. Primary primary inventors of the pyramidal bureaucracy, mm -hmm. because from his point of view, the the uh, the matrix structure fractures 
fractures authority in a chain of command beyond all recognition. And, and we just can't have that, you know, as, oh, no. <laughs> as, as he would have felt. And you can kind of go down the list within your practice. This is something that we can, we can test this conjecture against the reader's own or the listener's own experience. Within a, so the way I would put it is within your field, think of some of the most important concepts and theories in your field. Where did they arise? Where did they first begin to be uh, synthesized and practiced and, 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 uh, uh, and evolved? I think you'll find that a very significant number of key concepts came out of practitioners and their efforts to deal with specific issues that they had with their clients and client organizations. But something had to happen there. Uh, you happened to be there at the time in California, early in your career, when initially the complaints from the East Coast scientists uh, started, you know, people to uh, have to scratch their heads. But my point is that in any of these times, when from a problem solving of a practice nature stems a theory, there has to be some people who whose practice in a way is thinking theoretical, who have that other state of mind that says, let's see if we can generalize this condition uh, and codify it and then and tell I've, people about it. You've been around doing some of that in your career because I've seen some of your ideas in your books and then they get repeated. And sometimes they don't even know that was your concept. Uh, theory, um, theory and practice, I think, is something you taught back when I was your student in the, in the late 60s, looking at theory and practice, but perhaps that came from other people. But it, when you're looking for the theory, when you're observing practice or even having practice, and then you want to put that up into a, a shareable entity called theory, then you've got the best of both worlds, don't you? Well, yeah, I mean, why not? Uh, particularly if you can if you can frame the theory in some kind of a way that that retains its connection to the to the practical problem so that you that's can, it so that you can carry it from one place to another and and you don't have to you don't have to go back to a laboratory or you or you don't have to have a supercomputer doing some kind of multiple uh, regression analysis on the problem I think uh, my memory now as we talk is that a number of key uh, concepts in statistics initially came out of back of the envelope uh, doodling <laughs> by some, some of the famous names in statistics who um, came up with ways to uh, analyze specific bodies of data which subsequently were then generalized into uh, models uh, and, uh, and more theoretical techniques that that could that could generalize the uh, the approach a correlation co coefficient for example mm -hmm. or something like that so i again i i would emphasize that this is this conjecture is a rich one and i would urge listeners to try it out in your own area of expertise. Where does some of your favorite theories and concepts come from? And I'll bet you you'll find that a lot of them came from the practitioners within this field, not handed down in the form of in the form of deductions. I think we sometimes feel that those theories came down from the gods or <laughs> came out of the mind of, you know, one brilliant mind. Uh, and maybe many, many of them have over history of mankind. But I'm thinking now about people who are going to step ahead in the next few hours or days, and they're going to step right into a problem. Uh, just like we said in the fundamental definition that we read at the beginning of the podcast, circumstances have changed. It's a problem. So I, was, I think probably initially they start thinking, hmm, is there any, is there anything I've learned in the past is there a theory that will help me figure this out 
which would be lovely. In some cases, there isn't. And maybe when there isn't, because the circumstances are so different, and then they start talking to others about what they're struggling with, maybe that's the birth of still another concept, whether it's in a sport or in organizational action, wherever. In other words, could it be that practitioners like you and I or anyone else who's listening could be the source of a conversation that leads to a new theory or an improved theory? Exactly. I think we also need to say that practic practitioners being human beings and, and being focused primarily on, on the problems that they encounter at the practical level often have ideas in their toolkit or methods in their toolkit, which could very easily become new concepts in the field, but they just don't get around to writing the article or formalizing the data they have because that's not their focus. And I, I feel like I've met a number of practitioners within the fields of management and leadership and so forth who could, if they wanted to, uh, write a new book about uh, about uh, something in the field of practice that, that they have encountered, but they just don't get around to it. And and I say, you know, you ought to write that up. You ought to write that up. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a I have a psychologist friend who um, I'm trying to remember now. Um, um, at, at a time of attention deficit disorder. And there was a lot of attention being paid to attention deficit disorder. He casually said offhandedly uh, in a kind of a cocktail party environment, he said, you know, a lot of what we call attention deficit disorder is not that. It's intention deficit disorder that the person has ideas that they would like to follow up on, but they just never get around to it. And I, I like I, it. <laughs> I've always thought that was just a, a brilliant insight. And every time I see him, which is a couple times a year, I guess, at conventions and things, I say, Jim, what have you done about intention deficit disorder? And he smiles and says, nothing. Because My intention he, to write it up, but I don't get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's a good point. Uh, because he's he's a practical psychologist, not a not a theoretician, not a professor, and so forth. <laughs> it, se it seems, though, that, that uh, going forward, you know, one of our grand ideas for the world uh, in regard to this conversation is that we need to see more partnering uh, of inten a very intensive and very smart uh, practitioners with a person or persons who can observe, listen, be talked to about them, and then go back to the laptop uh, go back to the whiteboard and do some modeling or do some uh, putting those words on paper and put it back to them and say, what do you think? Uh, I suspect that that does go on, has always gone on, but, you know, practice is getting more, <laughs> in my experience, uh, anyone's practice is getting more complicated and difficult by the moment. And so if they did have these relationships where people who can do that, there would be some pretty fresh fodder for new or revised theory. What do you think? Well, you're reminding me, or I have not thought about it this way before, but in a way, what you and I are doing is taking intuitions that I'm sure many people have had over the years, and we're trying to formalize them a little bit with this idea of practice with a capital P. Whereas you might talk to a given practitioner and his his or her reaction might be, oh, sure. Well, I thought about that many times, how different the perspective of the practitioner is yeah. from the theoretician or the external observer. Um, that's, but it's kind of a given. I don't worry about it too much, they might say. So we're worrying about it. We're saying, look, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, the... the the uh, gap between the actual practice of practice and the way people talk about it and the levels of understanding they have is, is too great. And of course, you and I as teachers, uh, the people who are paying the price are the students. 
learners who walk out of the classroom or the learning experience with their heads full of theory, but without much of a sense of how it's actually going to get applied in the uh, in the practical world. That's right. And that has been a motivation for your work for years and our collaboration, yes. uh, which began late, late last year. Yes. Uh, that gap uh, is bothersome. So we are now uh, one way that we're getting people out to listen in and give us their thoughts. And there is a feedback mechanism that we're building into these podcasts. Uh, we, I think the conversation is is necessary and as I've said several times it's actually a lot of fun to do conjecturing we're conjecturing which I That's guess right. is sort of the the early stages of something that eventually becomes uh, looked at as as a solid theory we may never see any of our conjectures get there but so what I mean the point is we need to have access to theoretical thinkers they need to have access to us as practitioners and we've talked about co-inquiry and the teaching learning process in the classroom this is another way it gets done we're down to our last few minutes again i i've got to get off my soapbox in a few minutes <laughs> uh but this gets me going i i just get this feeling that there's a mission here Let's see what we can do to close out this conversation and well, get ready for the next one. The uh, I think we can both say that that we've had a quite extraordinary learning experience in in reflecting, meditating on the nature of practice. We're we're thinking about things that we've never thought about before, mm -hmm. even though we have our both of us have an exposure to practitioners, which is uh, quite broad and. Uh, and there's just a lot there that we've never done much with. And now we're, we're trying to, our conjectures are our attempts, I think, to um, make more sense out of all of this experience that we have. That's right. I had uh, a breakfast yesterday with a, a very senior uh, level, uh, former executive from the famous sports net network. And uh, he was telling me in words that flew so fast I could barely catch them, how he and several other smart folk are putting together a streaming series, uh, in this case, focused on the ages between 50 and 70. So my yeah. first point to him was, hey, <laughs> you mean there's nothing after 70? <laughs> but he said that is a pretty crucial period of time for bringing out uh, essentially lots of different ideas for people to think about and use as they're practicing being alive between 50 and 70, which in itself is not well, that's, an easy that's, trip. <laughs> that's when the beer bellies accumulated is between 50 and 70. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, my point in this and sort of capping this discussion off is that as I was listening to him, I was listening as I would a business professor type, you know, is he going to, can they possibly make money? And he was flipping out all of these different equations that they've calculated and how much they'll have to make in the first year and all that. And it was quite interesting. But what I was really looking at was this person who was on fire. I mean, he was so excited. Uh, and because it had picked him back up out of a phase of his time after we left that, that organization where he wasn't doing this sort of high level stuff. And yeah. he's like, you're back in the game, aren't you? And he said, that's it. I, I have so much that I know, so much knowledge that I've taken nearly 40 years to acquire. I did not want to spend all my time on the golf course, at which point, of course, I said, oh, I see. I spent all my time on the golf course because I don't have any new ideas. And he laughed. But uh, there's a lot we can learn, definitely learn from today's practitioners of every sort. And that will shape some of our conjectures going forward so this has been fun and we're out of time so let's let's say goodbye to the folks and uh, we'll be looking forward to more of our conjectures in, in just a, a bit of time to get this next podcast together thank you dude thank you it's been really a very interesting conversation mm -hmm.